Well, good morning. We are glad that you continue to join KMCC through the online service, and, and we trust that the messages are beneficial to you and to your family. Uh, as we study through the history of the early church, as recorded in the book of Acts, we are reminded through the narrative of how the early church grew and how it thrived. And three things that spurred their growth were corporate worship, fellowship with other believers, and generosity. And if you consider KMCC to be your home church, I would encourage you to please consider how you can more fully enter into these bases of Christian uh, fellowship. First of all, worship by reading your Bible and praying daily and continue to join us for these online worship services each and every week. Number two, fellowship with other believers by emailing or texting or calling the staff and elders or even some friends here at KMCC. We would love to hear from you and to pray for you. And lastly, practice generosity by giving financially to the ministry of KMCC. Your financial gifts make it possible for us to continue to give this offering to you on a weekly basis. So please know that we continue to pray for you all. And uh, as you watch us online, if you have benefited from the services, we would encourage you to please pass along the word to your friends and family so they can join us as well. Be encouraged in the goodness of our God. Um, our speaker for today is Dave Field. Now, Dave is on staff at Ethnos uh, Bible School in Waukesha, and I think there's a few students that may have come to hear him speak this morning, just a few. Um, our families have been crossing paths for many years, all the way back to language school, which was back in 2000, I think, right, Dave? Yeah, we're aging ourselves when we say that. Um, Dave and his wife, Kim, spent a few years ministering in Russia. Um, back in the early 2000s, and now he teaches at the Bible School uh, and has spoken at a number of churches in Wisconsin. Uh, we are blessed that he and his family call KMCC their home church, and he has graciously agreed to speak to us today so that I could have a vacation the last couple of weeks. Um, and he's going to be speaking to you from the next passage in Acts. He's going to keep right along with our series. And before he comes up, though, I'm going to have Chris Del Ponte come on up, and he's going to read the passage for us today. Uh, as Chris comes up here, please turn to Acts chapter 15, verse 35. And if you could, please stand for the reading of God's word. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Messiah, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Messiah, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. to our heart. 
hearts, to our remembrance, to our minds today. And I pray that on our part, we would be obedient followers and obedient listeners. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, what we're going to do to begin with today is a little review from last week because we're going through the book of Acts to kind of tie events together a little bit, make some continuity, I think is a good thing. Uh, so last week we were looking at uh, an event called the Jerusalem Council. Uh, Acts chapter 15, what happens is Paul and Barnabas have been on their uh, whirlwind first missionary journey up in the Galatian area. They've come home to Antioch up, up uh uh, n northern uh, side of the, uh, or whatever side it is, of the Mediterranean Sea uh, in Antioch there. They're in their church, and, s and some men come from Jerusalem, and they say, hey, for the Gentiles who are coming to faith in Jesus, it's going to be necessary to be circumcised and obey the law of Moses in order to be saved. And uh, Paul and Barnabas, of course, disagree with that. There's a sharp disagreement going on there. And uh, the church in Antioch sends them down to Jerusalem to talk with the elders and apostles there about it. And we had the whole council, right, where, where they affirm the doctrine of salvation by trust, faith in Jesus alone, no law works added for that, nothing necessary. We're not going to require anything for salvation extra than faith in Jesus, you know, from the Gentile believers. So that's a good, a good thing. Landmark moment, actually, in the history of the church. A false teaching was put down. The gospel was maintained. Um, the church uh, apostles and elders did require uh, some things from the new Gentile converts, though. They were rather simple things. It was staying away from idols and from sexual immorality, things that the pagan world was into at the time and is into in our time. Uh, just saying, hey, these are, these are good things. You as Gentile Christians should be doing these things anyway. So they wrote a letter, sent it off with Paul and Barnabas back to the church in Antioch and said, here's our instruction Salvation by faith alone, here are some good things for you to do. That's where we ended last week. Um, we're going to turn in our, in our Bibles here to uh, verse 35 now of chapter 15 and continue. Uh, and I've got three points in your uh, sermon outline today. The first one is called uh, the breakup, and that'll come up on the slide here in a minute and then our, and then our text. Uh, so verse 35. It says, but Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and proclaiming, along with many others, the word of the Lord. So Paul and Barnabas, they stay there in their, in their home church of Antioch, teaching and proclaiming, it says, and other people were doing it as well, teaching and proclaiming God's word. A couple of interesting words here, teaching and proclaiming. Uh, teaching is something that the church does for believers. Paul and Barnabas were teaching believers in the church, teaching them God's word, helping them to grow and be strengthened in their faith. That's one side of their ministry. It says they were also proclaiming. The word is actually evangelizing. If you look at the original, they were teaching God's word to believers and they were evangelizing who? Who needs evangelizing? It's the unsaved. The church, as we can see in the book of Acts, as we can see in this verse, has a twofold mission. There's a mission to those who are outside. What's the mission? To bring them to Christ, to point to the gospel, to point to Jesus and bring them into the family of God. And then the second part of the mission is to work with those who are in the body of Christ. That job there is to teach God's word and bring people to a deeper appreciation of Christ, strengthening them in their faith. So that's what the apostles there are doing, Paul and Barnabas and others in the church in Antioch. Now verse 36. It says, After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's return and visit the brothers in every town where we proclaim the word of the Lord to see how they are doing. Uh, what we're looking at here is Paul, as a, as a missionary and as a, an, ap uh, an apostle, having care and concern for the churches that he has recently planted. Uh, in Acts chapter 13 and 14, Paul and Barnabas had traveled up in the Galatian area, and they had planted four churches. I'm going to uh, ask that we put up the map at this point. I'm going to show you where those four churches are. Um, so if you look at this side of the map, you see Antioch down on the bottom where they started off. And you can see the little blue line going up where they're going to travel. We're going to talk about some of that this week. But there's four little blue, uh, uh, red squares there, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Pisidian, Antioch. Those are the four cities they were in in Galatians chapter 13 and 14, uh, places where they preached God's word, saw people come to faith in Jesus, uh, in Lystra, there was the stoning, remember that, where Paul was nearly killed, and then he had to come home. Uh, so there's, there's where Paul is thinking about right now. Paul is back home in his home church. His mind is going back to where they were. He's like, hey, I wonder how the brothers and sisters are doing in those churches. New in their faith. They're in a hostile environment, by the way, right? Sometimes we don't think about that. Paul was nearly killed for preaching the gospel in these towns, but then Paul got to leave and go home, didn't he? 
Paul got to go back to Antioch, and who does he leave behind? A little fledgling group of Christians, and they're living in the zone where he got nearly killed. What do people there think about the gospel? Well, not so much. You know, there's probably some persecution. Actually, Paul talks about that in the book of Galatians toward Christians who lived in those areas. He says, man, you guys, you went under some real persecution at the beginning of your faith there. People didn't like it, you know? I don't know, it doesn't say whether people were killed or beaten, but it's, it's very possible that those type of things were happening, right? Uh, not unlike what we're seeing happen in Afghanistan right now. So Paul has concern, care for them. He says to Barnabas, hey, let's go back. Let's do Galatia round two. Let's go and see our people and see how they're doing. Verse 37, Barnabas wanted to bring John, called Mark, along with them as well. Okay, Barnabas wants to bring Mark. We know him in the, in the, the Bible as Mark. Uh, Mark was a young fellow who had accompanied Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, if you remember, um, and he is a cousin of Barnabas. Uh, if you write it down somewhere, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10 mentions that, that Barnabas had this cousin named Mark. That's who we're talking about. Okay, so he's a relative of Barnabas. Barnabas says, hey, let's bring Mark along. Mark came with us last time. Verse 38, but Paul insisted that they should not take along this one who had left them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them into the work. Okay, if you remember uh, from Acts chapter 13, early on in the chapter there, Mark had gone with them down through the island of Cyprus on the, on the map there. They'd gone to Cyprus and they'd had the uh, instance there with the false apostle, false prophet, whatever, and then they traveled up further north into the Galatian area. And at that point, when they made landfall in Galatia, Mark splits. He's like, I'm done. He goes back to Jerusalem and that's the end of Mark's journey. We're not sure why Mark left. We're not told. You know, we can guess. Maybe there's a little fear there. Maybe he was sick. We don't know what happened, but the guy left. Barnabas says, let's bring Mark. Paul says, let's not bring Mark. Okay? We've got a dis disagreement going on here in a ministry team. Uh, this is, this is uh, actually kind of par for the course, okay? Anywhere in the world where you're going to have, uh, you know, more than one person, you're going to have different opinions, right? And this is what happens here uh, on this min ministry team. Paul insisted they should not take him along, uh, the one who had left them and not accompanied. Paul is probably thinking, hey, Mark left us last time. Like, maybe it won't be good to bring him this time. Maybe he'll do it again. You know, I'm not sure what Paul is thinking, but it seems that that could be the case. Look at verse 39. They had such a sharp disagreement so that they parted company. Barnabas took along Mark and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and set out, commended by the grace of the Lord etc. The disagreement was so sharp between Paul and Barnabas that they split. This is a sad moment in the book of Acts for the Paul and Barnabas team. This, this one makes me sad. This is like one of those moments you look at and it's like, Paul, Barnabas, like you got to be kidding me. You know, you guys couldn't get along on this and you split. That's hard stuff to, to handle. Um, let's talk about this for a minute. Who, who was Barnabas? Barnabas' actual name, if you look back in, in uh, Acts chapter 4 or chapter 5, is Joseph. He's a Levite from, uh, from Cyprus, from the island where the guys went to on their first journey. That's his home area. He's given a nickname by the apostles. The nickname is Barnabas, Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement. Okay? It's a nickname with meaning, right? Barnabas is this encouraging guy. He loves Jesus, and evidently Barnabas loves people. You can kind of see that through the story. You get a, a, a Paul. Remember who Paul was before he was saved. Paul is this persecutor of the church, right? He's going door to door and pulling out men and women and taking them to prison and beating people in the synagogue and heading up to Damascus to do the same thing up there. Meets Jesus, does a complete 180. Jesus is now Paul's Lord. Paul tries to go back to Jerusalem and get back in with the apostles there and say, hey, you know, I'm sorry, it's me. Like, I've become a Christian now. Nobody wants to listen to Paul. Paul's scary. Maybe it's a trick of some kind. You know, maybe he's just pretending to be a Christian. Who trusts Paul? Barnabas does. Barnabas listens to Paul. Hey, it's a real conversion. The man knows Jesus. He met him on the road. Barnabas takes Paul along, brings him to the apostles and says, hey, you need to listen to this guy. Takes him under his wing a little bit. Gets the guys to listen to him. Pretty cool moment there for Paul. Uh, Barnabas was the, one of the leaders of the Antioch church. When people started to come to faith in Jesus up there in Antioch, Barnabas went up to help strengthen them in their faith, taught for a while, encouraged people along in the new way of Jesus. And when ministry got too much and he needed help, who did he reach out to? He reaches out to Tarsus where Paul is from. He says, hey, I remember this guy who came to Jesus, real firecracker, you know, for the Lord. Paul should come and help me in the work. So he calls Paul in and brings him into ministry, gives Paul his introduction to the Antioch church. Really cool person this Barnabas guy. I like him. 
Uh, he's the man who went with Paul on his first missionary journey, went through all the hardship there, the stoning in Lystra, etc., etc., and he is the guy who stood shoulder to shoulder with Paul in Acts chapter 15 against false teaching. This man is a dear brother, a close friend, a partner, a colleague, right, of Paul's. To see these guys split at this point is heartbreaking. Look at that. I was like, man, I wish they could have been together the rest of the book. You know, I was sort of looking for the next chapter to be Paul and Barnabas again, but that's not what we have happening. We have a breakup here. Um, now, some have assumed that Paul uh, did something wrong here, that Paul is at fault. You know, Paul is too hard on John Mark or something like that. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to land that for you here. I'm just throwing it out. This is something people have thought. You know, Barnabas maybe was more encouraging, maybe a little more trusting with John Mark, give him a second chance type of thing, and Paul is a little more hardcore and didn't want to give the young man a, a, another go at it. I don't know. Uh, one thing that is interesting is it says the Antioch church commended Paul to ministry. Paul is sent out by the Antioch church, commended by the brothers and sisters there, and when it talks about Barnabas, it just says that Barnabas left. You notice that? I think it's interesting, if, the, if, if Paul had been off, if Paul had been doing something wrong or maybe sinful, I think maybe people would have commended Barnabas and you know, maybe not commended Paul or something like that. The church sends Paul out, go for it, Paul, with our blessing kind of thing. Paul goes off into ministry, chooses a new guy, and goes off to do the ministry that he was going to do uh, in the churches of Galatia. Um, Barnabas, sadly, is never seen again in the biblical record. Uh, He's, uh, he goes back to Cyprus. Cyprus is actually where he's from. So Barnabas goes home with John Mark, his cousin, and uh, uh, Barnabas is never seen again in the story of the Scripture. Mark is seen again. This is kind of encouraging for those of you who wondered about Paul and Mark, how they get along, whatever. Uh, Mark is with Paul later in prison when Paul writes his letter to the Colossians and to Philemon. Those two letters were written to the same church, same group of people at the same time. At that time, Mark is with him, and he says in Colossians 4.10, um, if Mark comes to you, receive him. Okay? Receive Mark if he ends up with you. And then in his last letter to Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, Paul says, bring Mark along, Timothy, uh, to me because he is useful for me to ministry. I don't think Paul had it out for, for Mark. I don't think that Paul disliked Mark. I think what may be happening here is Paul was going up into a rough area, an area where there'd been violence before. Mark had left one time already before. Maybe he's just thinking, hey, I don't know if Mark's the right guy for this mission at this time, you know? Maybe later, but maybe not now. That's kind of how I read the data there a little bit. It's hard to tell, um, but we're just trying to put it together. One thing we can say in terms of application is that disagreement happens in ministry. Goodness, disagreement happens everywhere, right? It's not just in ministry, but ministry is a place where you, you think, okay, this Christian people working together like never will people ever disagree. <laughs> Wrong, right? As long as we've got different personalities, as long as we've got different ideas and different thoughts, people are going to have, have conflict. Conflict is where you've got differences of opinion. And the, the, the deal is what we do with the conflict. Uh, that's where people get into sin, Right? Yeah, embracing pride or, or, or getting uh, aggressive or, or whatever. Conflict is natural, though. Disagreement is natural, and it happens, and it happens in ministry. Uh, Paul would write later in Romans chapter 12 that if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. I really like the way he says that. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. We, we are, it's on us to do our best to live at peace with people to live at peace with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Is it always possible to have peace? No, it is not. Sometimes it doesn't depend on you. You want peace, they don't want peace. What are you going to do? You have to do your part to reach out to try to have a relationship of peace and get along with the different ideas. That's what we're called to do in Scripture. But sometimes those things are out of our control, right? And Paul says that there in, uh, in Romans chapter 12. All right, well, back to our story. We're going to go to verse 41 here. It says, Paul passed through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, we're going to take a look at our map here again. Uh, what is happening is Paul is going up, um, a, taking a different route to the area he had been in 
before. If you look down, you can see the island of Cyprus. That's where they had gone to uh, the first missionary journey, and then they'd taken the ship north and gone up to plant those churches. What Paul does this time is he doesn't go by sea. He takes the road around. There was a beautiful Roman road back at the time there that went exactly where the blue line goes, and he, he works backwards through the area uh, where those churches were to strengthen them, to teach, to check out, see how they're doing. Uh, one thing that is interesting is that there's a city there, Tarsus, that's circled in red. That's Paul's home area. So Barnabas goes home to Cyprus. Paul goes up through his home area and makes his way further west to, uh, to teach and to preach there in Iconium, Lister Derby, and uh, the other Antioch. There's a uh, Pisidian Antioch, you can see it there. Two Antiochs, by the way, in the book of Acts. There's the one that's Paul's home church down here. That's Antioch of Syria. And the other Antioch, Antioch of Pisidia, is in Galatia. All right, let's look at verse uh, 1 now of chapter 16. It says, he also came to Lystra, sorry, to Derby and to Lystra. So back where he was, where he was, where he was nearly killed. A disciple named Timothy was there, the son of a Jewish woman whose father, uh, sorry, a Jewish woman who was a believer, but whose father was a Greek. Okay, we uh, now meet a person named Timothy. This is the first time this guy is mentioned in the New Testament record, and he becomes a very important person to Paul and to the story of the New Testament. Uh, so who's Timothy? Timothy has a Jewish believer for a mother. It says that. Jewish Christian lady, okay? Okay. Um, but his father, it says, was a Greek. Uh, now, two things about Paul's father. Number one, when, when the New Testament and uh, the book of Acts especially uses the word Greek, very often it's not meaning that they are ethnic Greek. Usually what it means is they're Gentile. It's a Jewish way of looking at the world. There's the Jews and then there's everybody else. What do we call everybody else? Well, they're all Greeks. Okay, now, was everybody really Greek? No. But what happens is in, the, in, in a couple hundred years before Jesus came, died, and rose, we had Alexander the Great, who was a Greek, take over the entire world, and everybody sort of thought it was cool to speak Greek like Alexander and embrace Greek culture, and the whole world sort of went Greek a little bit. All right? And so the Greek world is out there, and then the Jewish world is in here. That's their way of looking at things. So in the New Testament, when they talk about Jews and Greeks, they're saying us and everybody else. It's another way of saying Gentile, non-Jewish people. So we have Timothy, who's, who's kind of half and half. Timothy is raised by a Jewish mother, who's a Christian, by the way, and a Gentile father. Notice what it didn't say about Timothy's father. It doesn't say he's a believer. Okay, so Timothy's half and half in another way. He's got a, a mother who, lo who knows Jesus and a dad who doesn't know Jesus. It would have said it if his father was a believer, right? So unsaved family member there in Timothy's background, a Gentile man. Uh, some wonder from verse 3 if the father is still alive, but we're not certain on that. So let's just leave that one for now. Now, uh, it is likely that Timothy and possibly his mother and grandmother came to faith in Jesus during Paul's ministry in the city of Lystra where Paul was nearly killed. Uh, where else would he have heard the gospel, you know? Um, the other possibility is that he was led to Christ shortly after Paul left by somebody else, by another Christian, and that makes sense as well. One thing we do know is that from, from uh, is it 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 1 Paul says, Timothy, you were raised in the faith by a Christian mother and a Christian grandmother who taught you God's word. Okay, so we've got some Christian people in the family there, his mother and his grandmother, who stood in and taught him God's word in the place of his unsaved father. Timothy becomes one of the most important figures in Paul's ministry in the coming years. Paul takes him along into ministry uh, at this point, entrusts him to represent him, Paul, to different churches at different times. Uh, P uh, Timothy ends up as a leader in the church in Ephesus. We see that in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul leaves him there to, uh, to uh, ordain elders and to set some things in order and to teach. Um, and Paul writes some of his most tender, or I will say his most tender, correspondence to this guy and calls him my dear son in the faith more than once. Okay, so these guys end up with a close relationship. I think it's kind of interesting. Paul and his relationship with John Mark it was a little different, right? Paul looks at John Mark, he's like, I don't know if this guy's ready. But then he sees something in young Timothy that he didn't see in John Mark. I think he's ready. And I think Paul in this instance is right. Timothy turns out to be a real servant of the church, a servant of the gospel. Turns out really well uh, in the Bible record. We see that. All right, last thing here. Timothy's half Jewish, right? Half Jewish, half Gentile. Uh, raised with the Old Testament scriptures, we know that. But he was not raised, evidently, in a very strict, observant Jewish home. 
Timothy, it says, is not circumcised. Every Jewish male is circumcised or you're not Jewish. That's the way they look at it. That's Old Testament scripture. That's just what you do, you know? So Timothy wasn't raised that way, probably due to the influence of the Gentile father, whatever. Um, note, at the, at the time here, many Gentiles mocked the idea of circumcision among the Jews, just kind of a foolish thing, looked at it as silly and weird and all that stuff. I get it. Um, and uh, a, a circumcision was evidently a stopper for many Gentile men, especially, to consider the faith of Judaism. You know, they'd listen to the teaching about one God only and not the pagan idols and all that stuff. When it came to circumcision, it was like, ah, we're going to take a pass, right? We don't, don't want to get too deep into Judaism there. That'll, that'll do something we don't want to do, so let's just stay in our pagan world and kind of watch it from a distance or whatever. That was just the reality at the time, okay? Timothy isn't circumcised for whatever reason. Look at verse uh, 2. Says the brothers in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Okay, so the Christians in Lystra and Iconium speak well of Timothy to Paul. Evidently, Timothy is walking with Christ. He's living the Christian life out well. Um, highly spoken of. This is a good guy, Paul. Like consider this young man. Okay, look at verse three. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. So Paul wants him for ministry. Let's go be part of the team. Here's Paul putting his new team together, right? We're in the second point there. Uh, Silas now has joined and now Timothy. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts because they all knew that his father was a Greek. All right. What in the world is going on here? Okay. Just last week, we had a huge kerfuffle about circumcision, and we go to the uh, Jerusalem church and talk with the apostles and elders, and it is affirmed that circumcision is not necessary for the gospel. Right? We're not going to require that. It's a nothing. Faith in Jesus is the way. Trusting him alone, that is salvation. That's it. Uh, so what is Paul doing here? You know, this passage actually has been a, a bone of contention for a lot of Bible readers for many years. People look at this and they say, Paul, like you're giving up on the gospel. Like what are you doing? You're, you're, you're giving a bad example here. Why in the world would Paul have Timothy circumcised if it wasn't uh, for salvation? I want to give a couple of thoughts on this that I think will be helpful. Uh, so number one is this. I think this is pretty important. Paul is clear on the gospel. Number one, Paul received the gospel directly from Jesus from his very mouth. He makes that point in Galatians chapter 1. Like Jesus talked to Paul and told him what to teach. Paul's an apostle, right? Direct relationship with Jesus. Paul knows the gospel. He isn't confused about it. It's not circumcision. It's faith in Jesus alone. Um, we see this in Acts chapter 15 where Paul and Barnabas fight the guys who try to teach circumcision. We see it when Paul and Barnabas come back from the Jerusalem council and deliver the letter of recommendation from the Jerusalem church and they say, hey, Gentile people, circumcision is not for salvation. Just do these other things because it's, it's good practice not to be an idol worshiper and an immoral person, you know. But salvation is faith in Jesus alone. Paul stood for that. We get it. Um, you read uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians, which is kind of interesting. Letter to the Galatians is Paul's first letter and it's written to guess where? The four churches in Galatia, the ones you just saw on the map. Paul came home from doing that missionary journey and he writes a letter to the Galatian area saying, guess what? There's false teaching spreading saying circumcision for salvation. Don't believe a word of it. That's not what Jesus told me. It's faith in Jesus alone. If you want to read an interesting thing this week, take half an hour, sit down and read the book of Galatians. It's really short. It'll go by pretty quick. And you'll get a, a really good window into Paul's thinking and Paul's teaching, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit on this idea. Paul is strong in the gospel. He gets it. That's the first thing. It says in the verse here that Paul had Timothy circumcised because of the local Jews who all knew that Timothy's father was a Gentile. This gives us a clue into Paul's thinking and why he did it. Timothy, because he was not circumcised, in the eyes of a, of a non-believing Jewish person would be considered what? He would be considered like a Gentile. And worse off, he would be considered maybe like an apostate Jew, like a Jew who had given up on his Jewishness, given up on his Jewish faith. Timothy trying to go into areas where the gospel hadn't been heard yet and talk to Jewish people, if they knew that he was like an apostate Jew or a Jew that wasn't living according to God's word or, or maybe a Gentile, you know, after all, technically speaking, right? Uh, Timothy wouldn't have had an audience with Jewish people. That would have closed doors for Timothy. 
That's interesting. Uh, the circumcision was a Jewish identity marker. Now, we have to ask a very practical question at this point. Some of you are asking in your head, so I'm just going to throw it out there. Number one, how in the world would anyone know if Timothy circumcised? That's kind of a private mark, right? So let's talk about it really briefly. We won't spend a long time on it. Number one, in our culture, who cares, right? But in their culture, in Jewish culture, they care. And so talk goes around. They know what family is circumcising their boys and what family isn't. And they remember, oh yeah, that guy's not really Jewish, you know. They're giving up the faith type of thing. They would remember that. They would talk about it. Another thing is, in the, in the culture of the time, Greek culture had what was called the gymnasium. It's the gym. The guys go and work out. And participation in the gym involved nakedness. People wouldn't just hear about it. People would know. Okay? whether Timothy was circumcised or not. So people know. It says the Jews in those parts knew about that. Second question we have is why in the world would anybody care? Who cares, right? Our culture looks and is like, who cares? Like, it's just not an issue for us. Let's ask why, why do they care? For an observant Jew, one of the first commandments, maybe the first commandment, which was to be obeyed for a, a, a newborn baby boy was to be circumcised according to the law. Be circumcised on the eighth day, according to the law of Moses. That's the first thing you do, right? It's considered a mark that they were part of the covenant race, part of God's people. Uh, now, there's some history on this one, too. During the period of time between the Testaments, between Old and New Testament there, when the Greeks came and took over and stuff, there were some pagan people, some Gentile Greek people, who actually came in with soldiers to Jerusalem and forced Jewish people to stop circumcising their kids and forced them to make offerings to pagan gods, trying to force pagan culture on them and, and squash Judaism. What happened? Well, a bunch of Jews grabbed their weapons and fought back. It's called the Wars of the Maccabees. You can read about it in history. Okay? No way will we give up our faith. No way will we give up obeying God's command to circumcise. No way will we worship any other god. And you look at it and you're like, way to go, Jews. You know, I like that. They're standing up for the faith. It's before Jesus came, right? Now, it's true that in Paul's time, there were some Jews who took the mark of circumcision as equating to salvation. You know, if you got the mark, then you're God's person. If you ask Paul, does circumcision equal salvation, he's going to say no. He says it all over the book of Galatians. However, you can understand that for the Jewish people, it's kind of important. It's important to their culture to have that mark. Mark of identity, you're part of that race or whatever. Uh, Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 5 and chapter 6, says two times that circumcision, being circumcised, or being uncircumcised, both equal nothing. So whether you got the mark, whether you don't have the mark, neither of them are any better or any worse. It's just a nothing. Uh, what he does say is that um, being a new creation in Christ and walking in love with other people is really what matters. Paul will say that in his letter to the Galatians. He says something similar in 1 Corinthians there as well. Okay? And Paul in, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, says that in Christ there is actually no Jew and Gentile. In the family of God, we're not recognizing racial boundaries here. We're all one family, one people, one group, right, in Christ. We get that. So Paul's teaching is clear on the matter. Now, one thing that some people may not realize is that while Paul did not preach circumcision for salvation... Paul wasn't going around teaching that Jewish people should not circumcise their male children. There was a rumor that goes around, we're going to read about it in Acts chapter 20 or so, that Paul was actually going around the world telling Jewish people to stop the practice of circumcision. It's a false rumor. It wasn't true. If a Jewish couple had come to Paul and said, hey, should we continue with the practice of circumcising our, our, our male children? Paul would have said, yes, according to the law, you should do that. If someone had asked, is that what's necessary for salvation, what's Paul's answer? No. So what, what is the circumcision thing? Well, back in, in Paul's past, when Paul was like Jewish before he was Christian, right? Circumcision and obeying the law of Moses was the way, right? That's the, super important to Paul. He actually says that in Philippians chapter uh, 3 there or 4. He says, you know, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, born into a Pharisaic family, who was circumcised the eighth day, right? Like I had all the things lined up, I was doing the law just perfect, you know, in his mind. And then he says, when I met Jesus, all that stuff became like a pile of trash. You know, Jesus is what's important. So what was the way for Paul back in the day had become what? It had become a, a cultural tradition, sort of a non-entity, sort of a take it or don't take it. It's up to you. What, what do you want to do here type of thing? 
So it's important to the Jews, not too important to Paul anymore, but it's definitely not for salvation, we get that. It's a harmless cultural tradition. Um, so if Paul had been asked by a Jewish couple, should we circumcise our kids? Paul would have said, sure, go for it. Law of Moses says it, right? So then the question we come back to after all of this work <laughs> is why did Paul have Timothy circumcised? Like, what in the world are we doing here? For the local Jews in the Galatian area, that, that seems weird. Let, let me uh, read something to you here. You don't have to turn. I've got it on my, on my page. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want you to consider Paul's thinking on this, uh, and then we'll move on. 1 Corinthians 9, it says, For since I am free from all, I can make myself a slave to all in order to gain even more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to gain the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to gain those under the law. To those free from the law, I became like one free from the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but under the law of Christ, to gain those free from the law. To the weak, I became weak in order to gain the weak. Listen to this. I have become all things to all people so that by all means I may save some. I do all these things because of the gospel so that I can be a participant with it. Paul was sent out by Jesus to be an apostle to the Gentile world. You realize that, right? We've got 12 apostles for the nation of Israel, and we've got one apostle for the Gentiles. I don't know why God did it that way, but that's the way he did it. Paul's mission is basically the outside world, Gentile world. But realize this. Even though Paul was, is sent to the Gentile world, Paul was Jewish. Paul was Jewish through and through. Paul, through the book of Acts, you'll realize that whenever he goes to a new Gentile city, do you know where he starts his ministry? In the synagogue with the Jewish people. Why? Paul wants them to come to Jesus, right? Paul says in Romans, the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Like, you guys have the background. You're first in line to hear it. I'm going to tell you first. If you don't like it, I'll go to the other people, but I'm going to start with you, you know? Paul, in his letter to the Romans, weeps for the Jewish people because they've rejected Jesus. He reaches out to Gentile Christians and he says, hey, listen, uh, the Jewish nation has crucified the Savior and has actually kind of, without thinking about it, spun out the gospel message that opened the door for you people. So, hey, why don't you think about returning the favor and tell the gospel to some Jewish people sort of as a thank you for what they did with Jesus. He's encouraging Gentiles to reach out to Jewish people. Paul wanted Jews to come to Christ. He wept, he cried, he prayed that they would. Paul did not cut the Jews off even though they hated him. Realize in the book of Acts, most of the opposition Paul experiences, including the stoning in Lystra, was instigated by Jewish people. Right? Paul didn't cut them off. Paul reaches out to them. Paul will do anything possible to keep the door open to the Jewish people. And listen, if that involves having a half-Jewish ministry partner receive the right of circumcision to keep the doors open with the unsaved Jews, Paul says, let's do it. Not for salvation, but let's do it, because it's going to keep the doors open. I think that's what Paul is probably doing here. You know, today we have some things like that in our world as well. I'm going to pick on one just because it's fun, okay? Tattoos. What are tattoos? Well, tattoos are marks people put on their body. When I was a kid, you know, the guys who had served in Vietnam and the guys who had been to prison wore a tattoo. Times have changed, people. Tattoos, right? There's tattoos all over the place. A lot of people wearing tattoos. A, a, a tattoo is not a thing that's forbidden for Christians in the Scripture. Uh, what would the Scripture tell us to do if, if, if it was talking about tattoos? Probably it would talk about using wisdom in a decision to put a tattoo on or what kind of a tattoo to put on or not to put a tattoo on. Use wisdom that God gives and put the gospel first and foremost. We want to keep doors open with people for the gospel. We want to kick doors open for the gospel with people so we can spread the gospel to people. That's first, right? And so the practices and the traditions and things that we do that are not spoken against or for in Scripture, those are things we can decide on, but keep the gospel first and foremost, the kingdom first, right? Uh, so there's wisdom we have to use asking God's Spirit to help us. And this is how Paul lived. And you see him doing it with the, with the practice of circumcision here. They make, a, they make a decision, maybe a bit of a hard call there, whatever, um, for the sake of the gospel in that region. So there we go. There's the, hopefully that helped a little bit with the, the Timothy thing. Um, let's go ahead now to verse 4. It says, as they went through the towns, they passed on the decrees that had been decided on by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the Gentile believers to obey. Now, for those who still look at verse 3 and say, okay, Paul is giving 
off a bad uh, example for the gospel here by having Timothy circumcised, you have to read the next verse. Verse 4 says they're handing out the letter and saying, here's what the church in Jerusalem says. What did the church in Jerusalem say? Not circumcision for salvation, right? So that's right there in the next verse. Like we're, they keep handing out the letter, standing with the gospel as it says it. Uh, look at verse 5. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number every day. Um, listen to this. This goes back to verse 35. There are two things that are stated here. Number one, the churches were strengthened. What does that mean? It means believers were being strengthened. As Paul went to teach believers, believers were strengthened in their faith. There's the believer word side of Paul's ministry. Look at the other side. It says the churches were increasing in number every day. What does that mean? It means new people were coming to the faith. There's the evangelism side. There's the other side. There's the outward side of the ministry. Paul's mission is succeeding, right? We're encouraging believers, bringing unbelievers to Jesus. Now we go to our last point, a new direction. And this is verse 6. It says, They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the message in the province of Asia. Okay, let's look at our map here again. This is, uh, we'll just stay on the map, I think, here for the rest of the time now. Uh, Paul, at this point, is in the last of the little uh, red squares there, Pisidian Antioch area. And what Paul wants to do is go directly west into the, 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 the zone called Asia. Now, Asia is Roman Asia. This is what we call Asia Minor nowadays in our textbooks. Uh, Asia is a Roman province. This is all, all the country of Turkey, by the way, modern Turkey, right in the middle there and Greece is over on this side. So Paul wants to head directly west into the area of Asia. Now Asia is where the cities of uh, Ephesus, Colossae, Laodicea would be. Okay, those are names that are familiar to us who read the Bible. Um, Paul wants to go there. Gospel hasn't gone there yet. Paul's got plans. He wants to head into that area. There's a good road going that way, Roman road, right? So Paul tries to head that way and it says, this Holy Spirit prevented him from speaking the message in the province of Asia. We got to talk about that just for a minute. Holy Spirit, stop Paul from preaching the gospel. What? You know, how does that work? Okay, let's talk about it. Uh, number one, we're not told exactly how this happened. How did the Holy Spirit stop Paul? Uh, one thing we can say is that, uh, like we mentioned before, Paul is an apostle and he states several times in the book of Acts and in his letters that Jesus spoke directly to him. Okay? Paul's uh, conversion where Jesus spoke from heaven is not the only time Jesus ever spoke to the man. Jesus gave Paul information along the way, and this is one of those instances Jesus forbade him, the Holy Spirit forbade him from going into, uh, into this area. Maybe in a vision, maybe in a dream, maybe in something else. Second question, or second thought, we don't know why this happened. Why did the Holy Spirit forbid Paul from going into Asia? Number one, we, we know that the Holy Spirit wasn't against the gospel being preached in the province of Asia. Indeed, Paul goes to the city of Ephesus on his return trip, you can see it there, from this very missionary journey, and preaches the gospel. It says he's there with them for uh, a little while, preaches in the Jewish synagogue, and then in, on his third missionary journey that we'll tackle later in the book here, Paul actually spends two years in Ephesus, and it says there in the, in the record in Acts 18, Oh, sorry, Acts uh, 19, that all who lived in the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord, from Paul, we're assuming, right? So the Holy Spirit wasn't against the gospel going to Asia. Uh, Paul would later write three letters to churches and individuals in the province of Asia, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, right? So the Holy Spirit's interested in those people too. Uh, my guess is it's probably just an issue of timing. Paul wants to go to Ephesus, Paul wants to go into Asia, and the Holy Spirit says, not right now. I've got something else for you, Paul. Paul's like, yes, sir, okay? Now, let's keep looking at our text here. Look at verse 7. It says, then they, When they came to Mycia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to do this. Okay, look north on the map. You can see the word Bithynia up there, kind of a, on a curvy uh, axis there. Paul wants to go north, directly north in that area. Okay, so you get the idea. Paul has been blocked going west. Paul tries to go directly north. It says the Spirit of Jesus stopped him from going in there as well. Again, we're not told how. We're not told why. We're just told that it happened. Paul takes direction from the Holy Spirit. A uh, little, little side note here, a complete side note, but I think it's an important one. Notice in verse 6, it says that the Holy Spirit prevented Paul from going into Asia. And then who did it say prevented Paul in verse 7 from going into Bithynia? The Spirit of who? The Spirit of Jesus. Who's the Holy Spirit? 
Jesus in spirit form. Okay, this is one of those places where you can see that the, the, the two are one, right? Jesus, the Holy Spirit, it's the same. Uh, just an interesting note there. So Jesus speaks to Paul. Jesus' spirit speaks to Paul and says, I'm not going to allow you to go up there either. Paul is blocked west. Paul is blocked north. What does Paul do? Paul gave up and went home and hung up his missionary shoes. No. <laughs> Paul is a man on mission. I love Paul's heart. Paul tries this, the Spirit says no. Paul tries that, the Spirit says no. Paul says, let's go in between, let's go over here, let's keep moving forward with the gospel. Paul sends it northwest, and guess what? The Spirit doesn't forbid him. Paul keeps moving, right? I love the obedient heart. Paul is a man on mission following the direction of the Holy Spirit. Paul has been tasked by Jesus to preach the gospel to the world. Paul is all about that, and he's modifying his travel plans based on the voice of the Spirit at the time. I love it. Holy Spirit's in charge of Paul's life. Now, Paul ends up at uh, Troas, it says, and that's the last dot. We've got the big dot there on the map, and this is our final point where we talk about a new direction. Where is Troas? Troas is on the Aegean Sea. Uh, at the time, it's not much of a thing right now, but at the time it was an important city with a great port for those wishing to travel from Asia Minor, or, or as we would know it today, Asia, across into what? Across into Europe, okay? If you look at the map, we're looking at Turkey here. Turkey on this side is actually part of what we consider Asia. It's the beginning of Asia in our modern maps. And Greece over here is the beginning of Europe. So we have a kind of a significant moment here. Paul is in a port city looking across into Europe, looking across into Greece, wondering where he's going to go, seeking direction from the Holy Spirit evidently, ready to preach the gospel in the next place. Where do you want me to go, Lord? And then we have something that happens. Verse 9. A vision appeared to Paul during the night. A Macedonian man was standing there urging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. <laughs> this is quite a vision. And it has important ramifications for the history of the church. Uh, the Spirit has boxed Paul in from going directly west and from going directly north. Now he has a vision of this man standing on Greece, standing in Macedonia. Right Now we look at this map today and it has Macedonia up there and it has Achaia on the bottom. That whole thing is the country of Greece. Now there is a little sort of a splinter thing that's breaking off, wanting to call itself Macedonia nowadays. I find that interesting. Back at the time, though, that's two, two separate areas, Macedonia and Achaia. Macedonia is the home of Alexander the Great, who took over the world, made everything go Greek back in the centuries before Paul, okay? So we have, Paul has this dream, there's this man, he's a Macedonian, he's standing there. Hey, how would Paul have known that the man in the dream was a Macedonian? People have thought about that a little bit. Here's the deal. Paul has traveled. Paul has been all over. Paul has seen all kinds of people. So somehow in his dream, in his vision, Paul's able to identify this Macedonian guy. I can tell by the way he's dressed or the way he talks or something, you know. And he's standing there and he's saying, come over here on this side and help us. I love it. Paul is being called in the vision to leave Asia and come over to Europe. God directed Paul to bring the gospel into Europe in this vision. And if you look at maps of the early church, within a hundred years of the death of Jesus, the gospel went through Macedonia and into Europe and right up to the British Isles by the end of the first century of the church. Pretty amazing. Holy Spirit directed that, sent the gospel over there. That's the background of many of us, right? Paul was among the first to spread the gospel message in this direction, prompted by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at verse 10. After Paul saw the vision, we attempted immediately to go over to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. Paul and his companions take this vision as direction from the Holy Spirit to head into Macedonia, to head into the unknown, into a new world, a new place, new struggles, new trials, with the Holy Spirit by their side. And he's not going to leave them. He's going to take them into the next step of the journey, guiding and empowering each way. Uh, one thing I want you to notice here is what, what did the Macedonian man ask for? He said, come and what? Help. He didn't tell them what kind of help, guys. He said, come and help us. How did Paul interpret the word help? Preach the gospel. It's the best help we can offer an unbeliever, isn't it? And the church does a lot of different things, right? We do food programs and we try to relocate people who have been involved in disasters and take care of orphans and things like that. And it's all good stuff, right? Those are things we should be doing. But well, what is the greatest benefit we can give to anyone in the world? It's the gospel of Jesus, right? The message, the story of salvation that can bring them into God's family. The man says, help. Paul says, gospel. Let's go. I'm going in there. 
Uh, one little important uh, uh, text note here, and then we're going to give some application from this story. Notice the word we in verse 10. It says, after Paul saw the vision, we attempted immediately to go over to Macedonia. Do you notice that? We? That hasn't appeared before in the book. This is the first time. Who wrote the book of Acts is the, uh, the, the writer Luke, okay, Dr. Luke. Uh, Luke, at this point, joins the team. He starts to talk in first person. We did this and we did that. And then he'll disappear and it'll talk about Paul doing this and Paul doing that. And then later in chapter 20 and chapter 22 and chapter 27, it'll say, we, we, we. He'll, he begins to meet with Paul and join the team. So we got a, a, quite a new team here. We got Silas, we have Timothy, and Dr. Luke joins at this point in Troas for whatever reason. He's along in there. Just notice it as we read. All right, let's do some application from this point in the story and then we'll, and then we'll close. Sometimes people have taken this vision, Macedonian man vision, to mean that Christians need specific Holy Spirit direction to tell the gospel to others or to start some kind of new missionary venture into new territory. If you haven't got the Macedonian call, the Macedonian vision or something, some kind of direct Holy Spirit thing, you shouldn't venture out and try it. And I'm going to say this is not the case. Jesus told his followers in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, Acts chapter 1, go into the world with the gospel of salvation, right? That is our job. That is our task. We have been told. We've been given our marching orders. Christians are to take the message with them wherever they go and wherever they are. Think about this. Paul was going to go somewhere. You can see that. The Holy Spirit stopped this place and this place, but there's a few other places I can go. Paul keeps moving. Paul's going to go somewhere. What happens at this moment is Paul, in obedience to Jesus, is stepping out looking for the an next option. thing, and the Lord says, do this one. Take this option, please. Paul, intent on obedience, took it as a direction and moved out in faith. Uh, the church today does not need a fresh Macedonian call. We need obedient followers of Jesus who will preach the gospel to those around them. We need obedient followers of Jesus who will make paths into the unreached areas of the world with the sacred message. We need obedient followers of Jesus who will take advantage of opportunities and ask the Spirit to direct our obedient efforts into the most strategic areas. All of us can do that. All of us should be doing that. In the absence of a guiding vision or dream, we are all called to obey the Great Commission anyway. And listen, none of us are ever going to get to heaven and have the Lord say, hey, by the way, you told the gospel there to the wrong guy or the wrong gal. You went to the wrong place and spoke my sacred message to them. That's not going to happen. So live the gospel, preach the gospel, tell it to everyone. God's happy that you're doing that. And if the Lord directs in some special way, then follow the direction. All right, let's give some final kind of wrap-up comments application from the entire uh, passage. There's been several different movements in the story here, so let's just rewind a little bit. Number one, let's talk about the breakup. Conflict is part of life. We need to seek peace as much as possible and keep the gospel first and foremost, and we're going to need the wisdom from the Holy Spirit as we strive to keep peace and continue to live on our Lord's mission. There's one thing. Another thing about the circumcision. Traditions and customs like circumcision are just that. Traditions and customs. We can make use of these things to forward the gospel depending on guidance, depending on God's guidance, and, and depending on the audience or the situation we are in. We can be flexible in ministry like Paul was. Again, the gospel is first and we need wisdom from the Holy Spirit to know how to act for the sake of the gospel. And then lastly, uh, talking about Paul's new direction, all of us can live for the gospel. Indeed, we are commanded to do it. It is the commission for every believer. Uh, not everyone is a Paul with a worldwide traveling ministry. Do you realize that? I read the book of Acts sometimes, and if you read the book of Acts and you take it as, as, as like everything in here I must do, then all of us need to vacate KMCC and go all around the world. All of us, like every last one, needs to do it because that's what Paul did, right? Do you realize that the New Testament follows an anomaly? The book of Acts follows a bit of a one-off. Paul traveling around the world taking the gospel to the new places. The, the, the record follows him. It doesn't tell us about all the one-off, not all the one-offs, all the ordinary people who worked jobs every day and lived in a town that they never left their entire life. It doesn't follow them. It follows Paul. Isn't that interesting? What were those people doing? Well, we're not told, but guess what they were supposed to be doing? Living out the faith of Jesus and preaching the gospel to their friends and neighbors wherever they were, and all of us can do that. And that's what we're commanded to do. Most of us aren't sent on a traveling ministry, but all of us have the gospel. And listen, every Christian has a platform. You know what a platform is? A platform's an opportunity to share with somebody. All of us know Christian all of us know non-Christian people who need to know about Jesus. Somebody at your work, friends you've got, and then there's Facebook. 
Come on, right? We've got all kinds of connections. We have a platform. Are we using our platform for the gospel? All of us know unbelievers, every one of us, if we're a Christian today, have something to share, the gospel of Jesus, how Jesus has done something to save us and change our lives. So let us, along with the Holy Spirit, like Paul did, step out into the unknown this week in obedience to Christ's command and in dependence on the power of his Spirit. Amen? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, we love you. We are thankful for what you have done for us in Christ. We are thankful for what you have left us in the sacred record, showing us the example of the Apostle Paul. We thank you for the things we can learn from his life, the lives of those around him, and the mistakes and the decisions and their dependence on you. Lord, we ask that we would be people like this in our day and age. I pray that you would help us to be creative and to find new ways to share the gospel and to live out our faith that is so necessary. Thank you for being our encourager this morning. We love you. We look to you for direction in the coming days. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate the word that you give to us. All right. I'm going to ask you all to stand for the benediction. And uh, please join us for coffee out in the foyer. Stick around. Greet someone that you haven't seen before. Make sure that we... Uh, make everyone feel welcome today. Uh, it's again, it was really good to see you and thank you, Dave, for sharing with us. So receive this benediction. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Thank you, Artist Smith. Have a wonderful week. Everybody, thank you again for watching this online service today. We just want to remind you that you can go on our website, kmcc.org, and get in contact with us. We would love to be able to talk with you. You can send us an email. You can give us a call, whatever you'd like to do. We'd love to be in touch with you. Also, you can give online on our website at our homepage. There is a give button right there at the top of the page. Click on that. It'll redirect you to a new page, and you can give that way, or you can give through the mail, whatever is best for you. Anyway, we just want to thank you again for joining us this morning, and please tune in next week for our next online service. Have a great week.